If you don't believe it, they're happy to tell you that themselves. One of the most powerful secret societies in the world, not the only one, but one of the most powerful one, was called the Bavarian Illuminati. Please excuse me if you're familiar with some of this material, but I'm assuming that people here tonight are for the first time. Welcome. You came here for truth, you're going to get it. Well, one of the most powerful secret societies in the world was called the Bavarian Illuminati. It was founded by a German called Adam Weishaupt, but the mantle later passed to the famous Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini. Let's read his own words about his order, these secret societies. He says, we form an association of brothers in all points of the globe, yet there is one unseen that can hardly be felt, yet it weighs on us. Whence comes it? Where is it? No one knows, or at least no one tells. This association is secret even to us, the veterans of the secret society. The head of the Illuminati is telling you there's something above us. 1700s. Well, that's come up a little bit more to date. American history, Walter Rothenau, German General Electric, a man who had a lot of say in American politics. 300 men, he says, all of whom know one another, direct the economic destiny of Europe and choose their successors from among themselves. Joseph Kennedy, and he should know, said that 50 men have run America, and that's a high figure. Benjamin Disraeli, the first uh, Jewish Prime Minister of England who spent his life uncovering the network of subversive organizations, said the world is run by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. And your own Supreme Court Justice Felix uh, Frankfurter, he said that the real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise power from behind the scenes. Senator Inouye says that there exists a shadowy government with its own air force, its own navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideals of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. Hell, they created the law. You think they're bound by it? Think again. You're bound by it. They'll kick your door in. But you can't even stop them from the atrocities they're perpetrating on the world. Not yet, anyway. And as a general rule of thumb, to those who have studied this and are also beginning their study in this, let's just realize when it comes to these power hierarchs at the top of the pyramid that I'm talking about, as a general rule of thumb, it's not 100% true, but it's about 90% true, if you happen to see the rulers, the controllers, the kings, the princes, the dukes in the media, that means in magazines and newspapers and in encyclopedias and so forth and history books and on TV, chances are they are not the architects of the programs and the policies that they are instigating. They are just what I refer to as the people's champions. They are just what I refer to in the book as overworld figures. With very few exceptions, they are not the architects of doom. I have a DVD coming out next year called Evil's Willing Servants, which will tell you who are the architects. That's a, sort of a missing piece. But just for now, know that if you see them on, t the fact that you just see them on television, or the fact that you see them in the common media, they're lower henchmen. Never forget that. It'll empower you to know that, because they are not the henchmen. They're power, drugged, sick, perverted, toxic individuals who serve powers behind the scenes. There's no reason in the world to fear them. The symbolism confirms what I'm saying. Symbolism, the key is symbolism, symbol literacy. They may appear on paper, of course, as you know, at each other's throats, different parties, different networks, all appearing to be, have this faux democracy, this faux conflict. But as the symbolism clearly shows you, they all sit at Cecil Rhodes' round table. They all are comfortable, the criminals of the world pretending through their uh, full conflict that the ship of state is also difficult to run and the human race is just so hard to rein in and keep them all under order. We have to prevent war and bring peace. It's so damn difficult. Look at how difficult our job is. But who's, who are, whose table are they sitting around? What are the symbols telling you at the G7 summit? On paper again, it appears to be a two-party system. Is it? They're happy to tell you actually it's not. They don't going to tell you that verbally, but they're certainly going to tell you in other ways by the symbolism that they use, which I hope that most people in this room are able to decode. But think of the mass of humanity who are not. Ancient symbols being used in modern context all over the media, all over the world. Languages, words, symbols that we need to be able to understand what they mean. doesn't mean the symbol inherently is negative, but it ties in with the fact that they have obediences and allegiances. Not only are these individuals using ancient sacred symbols, but they are a one-party system. Whatever way the coin falls, they win. But more than just using 
you know, sacred power symbols and whatnot. These individuals have hidden allegiances that you and I are not meant to know about. So what, 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 what allegiances? Well, if I'm making a promise to you, but I've got my fingers crossed behind my back, well, how good is that promise? Well, these characters have very, got, very much got their fingers crossed behind their back. They have allegiances all right that come before their allegiance to humanity and to the world and to the professed stuff that they're talking about. Here's a perfect example. In Washington, D.C., the statue of George Washington. The whole story is shown to you here. Let's read it. George Washington, it says under the plinth, underneath the bust, Freemason and First President. Let's read it again. Freemason and First President. Now, I'm not even American. I'm actually from Belfast, but I take offense to that statement. Should it not be First President and Freemason? It should be, but they're telling you how the pecking order works. What comes first? And underneath you have the Masonic G. So these behind-the-scenes allegiances come before, and you need to know about it. That's why you never get justice in the courts. That's why you never see any of these people are brought to justice, because of their allegiances that you need to know about that come long before their allegiances to you. Now, in the inception, in the inception, let's not forget that your greatest enemy of this country wasn't the French, wasn't the Russians, wasn't the other Mongolians, wasn't you know, uh, the Iraqis, wasn't the Afghanis, wasn't the Arabs. Oh, guess what? <laughs> Look it up in a history book. Who, you tell me, who is your first enemy? England, Britain. Now, the British royals were not worried that force of arms had not secured America for them, right? because basically they got their ass whipped 200 years ago. Don't let's get started with wondering what happened to America in the meantime to become so complacent. Let's leave that one aside. But armed force, they realized, was only one of many insidious strategies that the royals and their henchmen have used to undermine any rival. The Fabians were sent in as agents in the following years to do their work. Okay, they've got plenty of other strategies. So President McKinley, Henry Ford, Howard Hughes, Charles Lindbergh Sr., Senator Joe McCarthy, and anyone else who knew what was happening were either politically or even physically assassinated. Now, who are these Fabians? They're a wing of the secret societies, and they believe in what's called the War of Attrition. You should write that down. The War of Attrition is very important. The Fabian Society, founded in 1883, played a catalytic role preaching the inevitability of gradualness in the movement towards a socialist society. Socialist is a... Uh, a uh, secret society term, by the way, not a political term. We'll come to that later. Taking their name from the Roman warrior Fabius, who learned to wait patiently before striking a fatal blow against Hannibal. Hannibal is charging over mountains. Hannibal is plowing through jungles. He's hauling elephants across Asia Minor. He's busy crossing lakes. Well, Fabius is sitting whittling on a piece of wood, waiting patiently. Right? The spider in the web. Originally, before and during the American War of Independence, relations were good, very good, with many other powerful nations, like Russia, like France and Germany. People looked to America with respect and admiration. But the Vatican and the British had a great deal to lose if the world's other nations and governments began to base their political systems, you see, on the original American model, which was scintillating. The whole eyes of the world was watching. The Tsar was sending you ships in the War of Independence. Relations were good. Instead of a cold war, which you had to endure, your forefathers had to endure lasting generations, what would have happened if the admiring Tsar of Russia had modeled his rule, right? He was getting ready to do it, by the way, before the Bolsheviks moved in. But what would have happened if he had totally based his, uh, his rule on the American system? And what would have happened, may I ask, to Vatican-controlled South America had North America remained sovereign and solvent up here, right? all that mind control down there under the name of religion, what do you think would have happened down there to that country had America been a shining example? You think that the British and that the Vatican could, you know, tolerate that? The American Democratic Party originally was called the Democratic Society. It's actually an offshoot of the Jacobin Club or the Jacobin Society, which is nothing more than the Illuminati that we've been talking about. The Illuminati's main tentacle operating in the political domain is known in England as the Fabian Society. Their socialist, so-called progressive, but it's really a pseudo-progressive ideology, is disseminated by the Democratic parties and their other left-wing interests. 